I realized it wasn't love when I started to mess up a lot, you know, and I wasn't receiving the affirmations that I was receiving from him prior. When we would make drop-offs, I would lose money, you know, because we weren't allowed to carry around a purse because um, we could, you know, have things in our purse. So I had to keep it on my person, under my dress, and sometimes it, the money would fall out. So it would be things like that where I would mess up and, um, and then that there would be some type of punishment. I always sat in the front seat because he, he and everyone else was playing this part that I was the queen. But I really wasn't the queen. We had a queen, which is a much older woman who, you know, is there with us, you know, teaching us and, and all of that. And she just took the back seat, you know, and letting me sit up front all the time. So um, he would punish me, you know, like one of my punishments would be you sit in the back. He would never hit me. Instead, he would be on other girls in front of me. You know, and that's when I felt like, okay, he still respects me and, and loves me because he's honoring me, but I begin to fear him, you know, because I'm seeing his authority and how, you know, in my mind at the time, I felt like they were letting him do that. Because at, at this time, I really felt like um, I still had a type of, um, I don't know, will, or I still had say so you know, because I still was sassy about, I'm the queen, I'm the queen. Um, but the times where I saw this other side of him inside, I began to fear him, but I never wanted him to see that. And he would always say things like, if I didn't make up enough money, I wouldn't go get, we wouldn't go get my son. Or he wouldn't take me back to school because he knew school was important to me. Well, eventually I dropped out of school Right, so here he's, he's just constantly finding ways to pull me apart. Every pimp wants to break their girl. So there was that breaking point. I lost money again and um, I get into the car and I'm, I'm crying. I'm like, I'm so sorry, I don't know how this happened. And he just lets me know how disappointed he is with me and you know, and he threatens to hit me. We're right there, there are other girls in the back seat. I'm in the front seat with him and he looks like he's angry and about to hit me. I know what that looks like because he's hit the other girls. And I'm thinking, this is it, you know? So he looks at me, he says, you know what? I'm not gonna hit you because you're not worth it. To me, I'm, that was like, wow, that was powerful because I wanted to be worth something to him. I was, I, was, I was wanting it to be the way it was in the beginning. So he's quiet, we drive to the bus station and um, I can't remember where we were and it's raining outside. And he says, you can leave, I don't want you anymore, you're like trash to me. Oh. Man, that hurt me. And I turn to him and I say, I love you. And that's all I want. All I want is what we had in the beginning. What happened to it? I'm like pleading with him, pleading with him. And after this goes on for a while, he says, you know what? If you want it the way it was before, you have to do something for me. And I'm like, okay, what is it? And he goes, see that mud puddle out there? I want you to go on your hands and knees and get in that mud puddle. And I look at him and I, I'm like, Wow, really? He says, that's it. You can do that or you can go home. I go get out the car and get in the mud puddle. Raining, people are outside looking. I get back in the car, he looks at me and he says, get in the back seat. And the, the queen, she comes in the front seat and then everything changes after that. It's, it's, it just, it, it gets, you know, to the point where I have lost everything, you know. I lost my dignity, my courage, you know. I had given everything to him in the name of love or what I thought love was. I begin to have thoughts after that. It was then where you know, I saw him, I, I felt like I saw more of who he really is. 
Um, so thoughts after that point started to come in, like, you know, how can I get out? You know, and, and it was after then where he started beating me. I started getting hit. And um, so it was then where, you know, I started trying to gather my thoughts to see how can I make this happen? He knows where I live, you know. Um, I started to feel the threats and the danger. All of that became more real to me than before. So one particular night, our pimp, he, he made us make extra money and it was already about three o'clock in the morning. None of us could go home until we made double. And so we're back out on the street um, and we're using the system where, you know, we're on the sidewalk and a person in front of us is calling out the license plate number and color of the car. The girl in front of me, which is the queen, she gets into a car um, and as she's getting in, a car is pulling up for me. I'm calling out the, the name of the color of the car and the um, license plate number. And I'm also telling the car that's coming up for me that I can't get in, come back in about five minutes because I don't have another girl to, to relieve me. And someone, you know, with this system, someone had to be out in the street at all times. So as I'm telling the car, no, you know, I'm not getting in, the queen, she looks at me and she says, no, you have to get in there uh, because we have to make money. You know, and she's pointing at her watch like, you know, we don't have much time, go ahead. So, you know, I have to do what she says, so I get in the car. Our pimp had already told us where we would be going um, with the buyers. And so we get up to the stop sign and I say, make a right. And he doesn't. And so I figure, oh, you know, it's his first time. Let me, you know, let me show him the ropes. And um, I'm telling him how big and bad my pimp is and he already has your license plate number. And, you know, so when we get up to this next stop sign, you're gonna need to make a right. And he doesn't do it. I had already prior felt the sense of doom, you know, that I was gonna die. And I, you know, at that moment, I'm thinking, this is that moment, I'm, I'm, this is it. He passes this second stop sign and we drive up to this um, gravel pit. It's like a, a, it used to be a parking lot. He stops the car and he, he looks at me and says, give me your money. I, I just, you know, got in trouble for losing money. We're all working double time, you know, to make this money back. It's my fault and you're asking me for my money. And I, I look at him and, and I say, no, I'm not giving you my money. I'll do anything else, but I'm not giving you this money. So he says, fine. He pulls out a knife and he comes over on top of me and we're struggling. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm, I, I don't care, but I'm going back to my pimp with this money. So we're fighting, we're struggling, and as we're struggling, I can feel him gaining on me. As that's happening, I'm trying to decide what to do, and I, I hear an audible voice on the side of me, right to the right side of, of my ear. You know, the window is up, so it just kind of is like a, an echo, you know? And this voice says, what are you doing? You have a son. And when I heard that voice, it, it was like I had these blinders on my eyes and they had fallen. And like I suddenly knew who I was, and I knew my name and I'm thinking of my son and, and I'm thinking if I die tonight, no one knows where my son is. Only my pimp, he's the only one who knows and he would have him. And I mean, at that thought, I go, okay, 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 okay. You know, you can have the money, you can have the money. He gets off of me, I give him the money, and he throws me out the car, and he takes off. That's it. I never got cut, I never got hit, that was it. I don't know where I am, I just start walking towards the sidewalk, and I figure in my mind, at least I can start walking towards the city. So, I start walking, and I, I just break down. I look up into the sky and I say, God, help me, just like that. And then after I say that, a police officer, a car, drives up and I think, great, now I'm about to go to jail. <laughs> How worse can this night get, you know? He's yelling out the, the car window and he calls me, he's like, come here. 
you know, I'm like, okay. So I, I go over to him and he says, what are you doing out here? He said it like he knew me. Like, you know, I'm thinking in my mind, you don't know me. Why, why are you asking me like that? But it was just the way he said it with his authority as a police officer and he's a man. You know, he said it in such a caring way, like a father and a daughter. And that's what I needed. I needed a father figure to question me and to say, what, what are you doing out here? What's going on, you know? And um, I break down like, like a little girl. I did, I broke down. And um, he says, listen, let me tell you, get in a car with me. And when I get off of work, I will go ahead and buy your ticket so you can go get your son and you can go home. But I want you to promise me that you don't come back out here. And I said, yes, I promise you, I, I'll do it, I'll, I'll do it. And I got in a car and he kept his word, he never messed with me, he actually let me sleep, put me in the back seat and covered me up and finished the shift. And um, I went to go get my son and I went home. When we're out there trying to do an operation to combat sex trafficking, a lot of times the initial contact with the police is with the victim. And the trafficker will tell them that the police aren't their friends, um, that we're, we just want to put them in jail and stuff like that. And we, Law enforcement is a tool that we use, but it's not the only tool that we have. We took something small and we put everybody in it together. We have our Commonwealth Attorney Office who assist us with human trafficking. We have nonprofit organizations. We have shelters. We, we've turned around and we've made contact with so many organizations that are in the position to help people that are being trafficked and letting them know, hey, we're doing an operation. We would love for you to come out with us and help us out and speak to these people. And plus the fact that we are going out there and we're talking to the community. We try to do a, a, as many joint information campaigns as we can through other uh, sections of the department like our special victims unit we work closely with them the narcotics the gang unit um, you know, we, we try to get the information out to the patrol officers so that when they have questions they don't hesitate to call us I think it's um, it's kind of a paradigm shift in how we used to look at prostitution as a victimless crime we now see it we now know that there's uh, at least second and third order effects of prostitution are drug abuse, runaways, um, you know, sexually transmitted disease, broken homes, things like that. So the officers, um, if they don't recognize it, they, they do have mechanisms to call people who do. What I would like to do is, is have an immediate impact that night, you know, let them know that these, these girls that they're, that they're coming to meet for, for, for sex are, you know, they could be Da their daughter's friends, it could be girls that were brought here from other countries that against their will and, and see if they, we can reach them on a, on a human level. Virginia was once considered part of the dirty dozen. Okay? Its laws were not considered helpful to either prosecution of trafficking, um, those perpetrating the crime and or um, those who are being injured by it or that proper resources were being brought to bear to help on both regards. That has since changed and now the, Virginia is considered to be a green state um, but there's still much work to be done. The House has passed seven specific pieces of legislation this year that addresses human trafficking, and I'm very pleased that at least one of them is getting to the President for his signature, and I expect that it will become law. It's House Resolution 4980, and it deals directly with sex trafficking. In particular, it's focused on foster homes and making sure that children um, who find themselves in that circumstance get extra care and extra attention and their incentives for the states to uh, specifically look out for these children because they are they're fragile uh, more often than not and they don't have the infrastructure the family infrastructure that that certainly that I had and I needed so it's good legislation it's uh, it had support from both sides of the aisle I expect that President Obama will sign it, and that'll be a good thing. One of the things that has happened, which is good, is that there's now uh, the forfeiture laws have been, in, have been changed to allow for people to lose their property 
if they even do something the first time related to this issue of prostitution. You go out to now to purchase a minor in the state of Virginia, you can lose your car for doing that. Or not just a minor, but anybody. You, you go out to purchase um, um, sexual favors, you can lose a vehicle, you can lose anything associated with that crime. Penalties have increased. Um, um, for example, it used to be just a misdemeanor in the state of Virginia to purchase sex from a minor, um, which is incredible because before that, if you had sex with a minor, you could, you know, in most cases, it was going to be a felony. Okay, but if you exchange money or some sort of benefit, so-called, to them, then you, it became a misdemeanor. That has changed after a couple of years of battle over that issue. So that now, if you try to purchase sex from a minor, you can, in fact, go away for at least from anywhere from one to five years. Um, though there is a possibility of just getting jail time. But what I'd like to see is that expanded, because right now, if, um, I think the abduction law for somebody, abducting somebody who's 16, I think 16 under, is, you know, it's, um, I think, what's considered a class three felony. Um, it can be 20 years to life, I believe, and substantial fines. Um, but I'd like to see that age increased. What's the difference between a 16 and a 17 year old, you know? Um, and, uh, and there are a couple of other laws that are age graded. Even um, purchasing a minor, it's age graded. You know, to up to 15, it's a certain penalty. From 16 to 17, it's another penalty, but a le lesser one, as if that 16 or 17 year old was any more capable of really fully understanding what's going on. When you understand how somebody is trafficked in the first place, whether they're 16 or 17 or 14, 15 or 13 um, or younger, um, little difference. Yeah. One of the things that we really have to address in this area is demand. If there was not the demand for young women, for young men and such, then we're not going to have somebody trying to profit from that demand. And therefore, we protect more of our young people and, and our older people, for that matter, um, from this crime. So um, getting at those who are purchasing is an important issue. And that's why it was important that that felony got put in place for uh, minors. But we'd like to see some additional um, uh, things put into place.